Another traditional area, area that's covered in courses on assessment is standardized testing. Standardized testing in music and in other arts areas is not as common as it was in the middle part of the 20th century. And consequently, there haven't been many new standardized tests that have been developed recently. Along with kind of a philosophical perspective that it was important to know people's IQs because then you could prepare them for certain careers, uh, standardized testing in all fields has become less common, uh, particularly on aptitude testing, which is uh, an area that many of these standardized tests uh, focused on. Many of the standardized tests in music uh, were developed from, I would say, 1920 through about 1970. And there's been very little um, additional development since that period. So what does it mean to have a standardized test? Of course, we're all familiar with them because we've all taken them as part of transitions from one level of education to another. Certainly the one that we're most familiar with is probably the SAT, the Scholastic Aptitude Test. But many of you may have taken the GREs or the ACTs, which are also kind of standardized achievement or aptitude tests. In any case, to be standardized, it usually means that there's a, uh, a detailed description or specifications of the test. It's been tried out uh, and refined. It has a manual which includes norms. Now, norms are <coughs> ways that one can compare an individual score with a group. So sometimes, most typically, there are scores by age groups. So what do fifth graders usually do on the test? Um, sometimes there are norms by geographical areas. Uh, what do people in urban communities, how do students in urban communities usually perform on this test? So it, it provides the test, uh, it provides the score that an individual receives a context. So when you get a, uh, a score that's reported in a percentile, you know that you, that score is at or below a certain percentage of other scores. So if you get a score that says you've performed at the 87th percentile, 87% of the students that took that test scored at or below your score. And finally, standardized tests are developed by content and testing specialists. You know, organizations like the Educational Testing Service. And they hire people who are, you know, maybe music teachers or uh, specialists in uh, universities to come in and help them refine and develop uh, tests. There are three broad types of tests that are standardized tests. Aptitude tests, which serve to predict future um, behavior, future goals. Certainly, you might consider the SAT an aptitude test. The reason colleges use the SAT is because they expect it will predict college grade point average it will predict whether or not you're likely to flunk out of the institution that you're applying to. And of course, colleges reasonably want to accept students that are going to succeed. So the SAT is kind of a predictor. And therefore, aptitude tests use predictive criterion-related validity. I'm sure you remember that from the first uh, unit of instruction. There are also some standardized achievement tests. Most of the year-end mastery tests that are given by states, particularly in math and literacy and science and sometimes social studies, are really achievement tests. What do students know? There are some standardized music achievement tests also, but obviously they're not generally administered. You might argue that the National Assessment of Education Progress test that we talked about in the last unit is a standardized achievement test. There are also standardized personality tests and interest tests. Some of you may have taken, maybe in high school or maybe even in middle school, um, an interest inventory, which kind of suggested, well, what are your areas of interest and what vocational areas you might pursue? Uh, interest tests often have items on it like, what would you like to do? Go to a baseball game, practice your clarinet, or dissect a frog. 
And depending on which one you choose, they might suggest, oh, you're going to be a biologist or you're going to be a sportscaster or you should be a musician. Uh, now, that maybe is a crude example, but that's kind of how vocational interest inventories operate. When one is selecting a test, uh, one typically would look at the psychometric dimensions that we talked about in the first unit. Is the test reliable? What's, what does the test claim it's for? You know, is its title musical aptitude test? So you know what it's oriented for. That's probably, you know, the most important criteria. And is it usable? Some standardized tests take really long times to administer and therefore may be impractical in terms of squeezing it into your uh, program. So reliability, validity, and usability are important. Um, there is a uh, <clears throat> there is a, a, ma a book that's, I guess I'm not even sure it's a book, it might now be in electronic form, called the Mental Measurements Yearbook, which provides, which provides view, reviews of standardized tests. And so that would be a good source to use. It's probably uh, electronic now. Um, when I was in graduate school, it was this big, thick kind of encyclopedia, and you could look up different tests and decide on, you know, it would report their reliability, it would they would hire someone to kind of uh, give a review of it. Was it practical? How useful was it? And so there's the Mental Measurements Yearbook. Uh, and of course, reputation is important. You know colleagues who have used it. You should be able to review the test manual and maybe even try it out before you would uh, determine that you're going to use it. Certainly college admissions officers who use standardized tests to enter students, you don't know a lot about them and know from experience um, how students have done. So they know if they admit, it, they admit a student with a, let's say, total SAT of 1100, they can, you know, look at, well, what grade point average do they have in their junior year? And so I know that students with 1100 generally have a good grade point average and therefore I can continue to use the test or of course some colleges and universities have been dropping standardized tests as criteria for entrance because maybe they've decided that there are other more important factors in the admissions process. It's important when one is administering a standardized test that one follows the directions uh, and that uh, one is um, one will get back a uh, typically from the testing company a profile of each of the uh, students or sometimes they're aggregated by classes that took the test. Following the directions allows you to compare the results of your class to the norms. If you, for instance, if the test is time and it's supposed to take an hour and you give the students two hours to complete it, then it's really their results are not comparable or can be not really comparable to the norms that are published in the manual. So what we're going to do now for the uh, rest of this is to kind of review some standardized tests that have been around for a while. Carl Seashore was a faculty member who uh, worked at the University of Iowa. He worked in the early part of the 20th century and he is kind of the father, if you will, of music psychology. Uh, he wrote kind of the first book called Psychology of Music, and he published The Measures of Musical Talents in 1919. Some interesting things, and again in 1939, and I think actually again in 1960. What's interesting about the measures of talents is the notion that there are multiple talents. So there's not simply a single um, dimension. And he thought about these as native capacities, things that were innate. And his test had several subtests. It had a pitch test, it had an intensity test, it had a time test, a timbre test, memory and rhythm. And actually the first version had a consonance and dissonance test. But I think as one moves into the 20th century, consonance and dissonance get redefined. And so his later version, the 1939 version, dropped the consonance dissonance test. It has a good reliability index and was frequently used as a research tool in the first half of the 20th century. Uh, it's kind of the standard, you know, it's the first so that subsequent music aptitude tests were often compared to the seashore test. <clears throat> 
Kalwasa and Dykema, two faculty members, one at Syracuse, Kalwasa, and one at Teachers College, Peter Dykema, published a test in 1930. Uh, and it was very similar to Seashore. It's called the Kalwasa Dykema Test of Musical Talent. Uh, it has similar subtests. I think that last one is supposed to be tonal, pitch, timbre, intensity, rhythm, tonal memory, not whatever that word is, it's a typo. They used musical stimuli and um, it had kind of wider use than the uh, seashore test was. But again, we're in, we're in this period where testing was very popular, IQ testing as well as aptitude testing in other areas. Along, again, historically, uh, around in the mid-30s, uh, Kate Hebner Mueller, uh, a psychologist at the University of Oregon, developed uh, something called the Oregon Music Discrimination Test. And the reference I have here is um, in, the, in the 1960s, a faculty member at Indiana University, Newell Long, developed the Long Indiana Oregon Music Discrimination Test. And what's kind of interesting about this test is that the uh, examples that you heard on the record um, were altered compositions. So you heard two pieces, one of which was the original composition, typically Western art music, and you know from the kind of traditional stylistic periods from Baroque through Romantic. And then they changed the second hearing, or sometimes they were in random order, so sometimes it was the first hearing. So one of the two pieces you would hear were the original composition and one was the altered composition and you were to choose if you were to say which one you preferred and of course getting the original choosing the original composition gave you a right score and choosing the altered composition gave you quote the wrong score uh, an interesting area and somewhat controversial but it is you know it, it, it is an attempt at least to look at the idea of musical tastes and can they be measured by a standardized test. And how you define musical taste is obviously a big, important issue if you're claiming to have a test of musical taste. It had generally high correlations with ability tests. That is, kids, students who did well in music aptitude also tended to score high on this um, test of musical discrimination. <coughs> Maybe the best known test of music aptitude was um, Edwin Gordon's uh, Musical Aptitude Profile, which was first published in 1965. In the latter part of the 20th century, uh, we were much more sophisticated at developing standardized tests, so it um, reflects that new understanding of what musical ap what aptitude tests should look like. One of the challenges of the Gordon Musical Aptitude Profile is that it requires three 50-minute sessions to administer. So it's a relatively long test. It has uh, subscores like tonal, rhythm, and musical sensitivity. It has high reliability, and it seems to predict uh, musical uh, achievement later. Uh, because Gordon also worked, at, interestingly, at the University of Iowa as well as other institutions, and many of his doctoral students did work with on the musical aptitude profile. So there's a fair amount of research that was conducted in the latter part of the 20th, 20th century on the musical aptitude profile, and it is probably now the standard in terms of research purposes. If you were going to, in your research study, was going to were going to use a measure of musical aptitude, you probably would use the Gordon test. In the latter part, um, in the 70s and 80s, Gordon developed some additional tests. One was the primary measures of music audiation, which was for younger children. Then there was an intermediate measures of music audiation for slightly older children. And then finally, an instrument timbre preference test. And that was supposed to be used for predicting what student or helping a student choose an instrument. The primary, I, I didn't mention earlier, the musical aptitude profile was was supposed to be given to fourth grade and older students. The primary measures of music audiation, uh, and, and Gordon believed that fourth graders had a relatively stable uh, musical aptitude, that it had stopped fluctuating, that it had become stable at that point. Primary measures are, is given to younger children, I believe maybe four-year-olds, and the intermediate uh, would be given like in second and third graders. So these measures are to measure music aptitude uh, prior to one might administer the musical aptitude profile. 
Gordon defines audiation as kind of short-term tonal memory. So if you hear a piece, if you hear two pieces, can you tell that they're the same or different? That's kind of short-term musical memory. This is the um, scoring sheet or the answer sheet for the um, rhythm, see the R at the top left, uh, of the primary musical, uh, primary measures of music audiation, the PMMA. So I'm going to play you some examples of this. You can get a feel for what it's like. Uh, because this was administered to young children, rather than numbering the responses, they use icons. So there's the truck response and the book response, or the book question and the boat question. OK, so here's a little of this test. I think that was the truck. Truck. Oh, here's the truck. First. So if you think those are the same, you circle the two smiley faces. If you think those two Look. things were different, First. you circle the bottom one. Second. So you circle the bottom one because those were different, the, uh, the sad Look. face and the smiling face. First. Face. So here's the test. So I think you get the general idea about how that functions. Um, you would, th there were directions to read, which I didn't bother taking the time to read to you. Uh, you know, if the, if the two items that you hear, and the, the instructions say, if you hear things that are the same, then you circle the two faces that are the same. And if you hear something, two melodies that are different, or two rhythm, excuse me, this is the rhythm test, two rhythms that are different, you uh, circle the faces that are different. Uh, those first two, the truck and the book, are trial examples. So to make, you would stop the, te the tape and make sure that everyone knew what they were doing. And then you would begin it and go through sequentially. And there are, there's another uh, maybe 20 on the back side of this sheet, which we're not going to do. The uh, next, an another example of a test that Gordon developed is the timbre test. And this is the answering sheet for it. I think this is probably oriented towards uh, students that are probably about to choose an instrument, so maybe third, fourth, fifth graders. Um, you can see at the bottom, if you can read it, it was published in 1984. And in this test, you select which of the two timbre examples you prefer. And so he's Again, it, this is somewhat heavily researched, so he has some evidence that suggests that um, scores on this test are help students choose uh, an, an, a particular instrument. So I'm going to play you some of this. One first. Second. A circle or fill in which timbre you prefer. Two. First. Second. <laughs> <laughs> 
And so from the pattern of responses that you choose, and there are scoring keys for this, um, you're supposed to be able to um, assist a student in uh, deciding uh, which instrument they might be interested in playing. Uh, there's some mixed uh, results, I think, of this. Some, uh, some researchers have suggested this is not a uh, predictor of success in instrumental music, but again, it's a little mixed. In addition to testing music aptitude, uh, there are music achievement tests. Uh, music achievement tests take, you know, the, the difference between aptitude and achievement is that aptitude should require no prior instruction in music in order to do well on the test. So if you hear two, if you hear those two rhythms and say are they the same or different uh, as we did in the primary music aptitude, uh, primary music measure of music audiation, um, you don't need any instruction in a sense. You, that's kind of measuring your senses or your general understanding, I guess. But in music achievement, there the expectation that you have had instruction. Certainly the NAEP is an example. There are also college level examples and there are even uh, examples of standardized achievement test in performance. Alaferis, uh, James Alaferis, uh, someone who worked uh, at a variety of institutions including Boston Conservatory, uh, New England Conservatory. It's, um, he developed a entrance test in music theory kind of uh, to kind of assess well you know how much do you know and are you well equipped to be a freshman in college and he did this with uh, James Strickline what's it what are the th I put this reference up here because it's in 1953 and it's in the very first issue of the Journal of Research in Music Education there were two tests that Alaferis uh, developed one of the college entrance test and then and also one at midpoint after a couple of years of theory it focused on auditory visual discrimination. In other words, it was something on the printed page and you heard something and the issue was, well, are those two things the same or different? Uh, relatively reliable, it was published, it also had norms. And um, validity with grades, in other words, he looked at, did the scores on this test, uh, were they predictive of or did they reflect theory achievement in college? There's this kind of ambiguity between, you know, what is aptitude and doesn't past achievement also predict aptitude? The SAT, you could argue, is a, an achievement test that predicts future success. So it's, you know, it's an aptitude test in some ways because it's predictive, but it's really basing the prediction on previous achievement. Caldwell developed a relatively widely used music achievement test in, I think, 1965 is when it was published. It was called the MAT, the Music Achievement Test. There was also an elementary music achievement test, which was just for younger grades. It was pretty widely used during that period of time. Um, content validity is really important. So, you know, during a period of time in the 60s and earlier, when we were using a lot of standardized text, basal series music text tests, uh, published like my my Macmillan or American Book, American Music. Well, I don't remember all the publishers. Uh, in any case, um, it was the test was based on the content of these texts, so it had content validity. There were norms published for grades three through twelve, pretty reliable validity. You know, it depends on what you teach. If you teach something different than what's tested, then an achievement test isn't going to work for you. And of course, that's one of the big issues with these year-end mastery tests. There was also an Iowa test in music literacy, which kind of paralleled the Caldwell test, but was de developed by Gordon, Edwin Gordon. Um, <clears throat> I, I have some examples here. So here, the, the oral perception one would be, you know, you'd be listening to things and you, you would look, if you see there's major and minor, big M, little m, so that was the first kind of subtest here. Reading recognition, where you'd hear something and see if the notation that's on this sheet reflected what you heard. So it really does, you know, in a sense, require knowledge of notation. The first test, you could argue, required knowledge of major and minor chords or major and minor pieces. I don't really know if they were chords or just pieces. Uh, again, there's an rhythmic concepts, there's an oral perception. And 
hear reading recognition, so you'd hear something and whether the notation in fact was similar or was the same as what you heard. So that's the notion of notational understanding. Is what you hear, yes or no, the same as what's printed on the page? So that's achievement. Yeah, you had to learn that someplace. The Watkins Farnham Performance Scale is kind of an interesting uh, standardized test. You know, the notion that we here we're trying to standardize the notion of performance. And actually, it's been used relatively extensively in the armed services to help audition uh, band members for any of the uh, band programs, like the U.S. Army uses it today, still. It was initially developed in 1942 uh, just for coronet. And it was actually uh, Watkins' and uh, dissertation at Teachers College. Uh, the validity is um, good. There is a, the Watkins Farnham's performance scale is a wind instrument scale, but Farnham later developed a string scale. So there also exists something for strings, which is similar to the uh, Watkins Farnham for winds. Here's uh, an illustration of what it looks like. It's really a sight reading test. And the notion behind it is that you stop the student at the example in which they make mistakes in two consecutive measures, either a rhythm or pitch mistake. So you can see that it starts out relatively easy. And we play these, you know, the student is given these and plays them consecutively. And it gets harder. Um, as the test goes on. And so if it, let's say number eight, if the student makes a mistake in measures one and two, that's where you stop. And you say, okay, this student was able to go through the first seven without making, uh, and that's the level that the, the score the student gets is through level seven. As you can see, it becomes more difficult. These are sight reading, so you know, the student hasn't seen these before. and even more complicated. So if this was shoved in front of you, if you were a flautist, and you were pay, playing number 12 in five flats, we had a tempo of 132, quarter note equals 132, could you sight read this? You know, I'm not used to reading leisure, leisure lines as a bassoonist, at least not in the treble clef, so I would have difficulty, I think. And finally, number 13 and 14, and this is the um, the end of the Watkins Farnham. And in fact, the end of this uh, narrated PowerPoint.